is on and I need to double check one more thing which is do I have enough space on my drive to record the lectures and the answer is yes I got plenty because I might have mentioned that I only got a smaller hard drive it's a one terabyte hard drive and I have never felt the need to upgrade to anything bigger than that okay so what we'll do today is we are going to talk about how to perform addition. You might say, but that's not a, <clears throat> it's not a college class. This is something that belongs in elementary school. Even though it is multi-digit addition, well, we're going to work with base 10 first because that's what we are used to. That's what we are familiar with. So from using an example, I'm going to extract the essence of addition or multi-digit addition in base 10. And then from there, we're going to transition to base 2 addition. And then from there, we're going to extract the essence of base 2 addition and go like, wait, these things you know, cannot, we cannot do with base 10. But we can do these things with base 2 addition. And then we'll end up with um, you know, lo a logical um, implementation, meaning we can use logic gates in order to implement addition in base 2. Okay, So that's kind of the, the roadmap for today's lecture. So we're going to start with something like this, um, but I'm not going to use the conventional way of doing this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, you know, I will name these rows first, okay? Because naming is very important because that gives me a way to do abstraction later on, okay? So this is what I would call row X. This is what I would call row Y. This is Q, this is K, and this is S, okay? So x, y are really just the names of the variables or the two uh, numbers that we are adding. Uh, Q is an intermediate row. Okay, I'll explain what that is doing you know, in just a little bit. And then K is for carry. And you guys go like, but tech, carry starts with a C. Yes, it does. Okay, but I, I need that lowercase c for something else. Okay, so we, I'm reserving that lowercase c for something else. And based on these naming conventions, probably you can kind of guess that you know, the letter S stands for sum. Okay, so that's the sum you know, row. So we'll perform this addition. First thing is, what is 8 plus 7? So we talked about this a little bit, okay, you know, in terms of <clears throat> if I just ask without the context of a multi digit addition, 8 plus 7 is 15, okay, we, we know that. But in this case, 8 plus 7 is a 5, because we only care about the single digit of the sum. If it is a 15, the, the 1 will handle it later, okay, using a different way. So 8 plus 7 is a 5, and the 5 goes to the row of the Q. And because there are no additional, care, uh, there are no additional additions to the right-hand side of this column, because I don't have any uh, decimal points, so that means you know, there, 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 there are no carries going into this particular column. So K is assumed to be zero in this case. So I put a zero here. And then five plus a zero is a five. So this is no different from your usual way of performing addition, except I spell out everything in this case. So normally, the way you would do addition, okay, I'm going to put it on the side here is a much more concise way to do it, but it does not help me perform you know, the operation that I need to perform. So right now, you know, these two are about at the same place, except you know, I need a one here, because you know, there is a one, a carry of one, to column one. So now we also have to number the columns. The way I number the columns is exactly the same way that I number the digits. So digit zero, is the is the uh, is the digit that is respons responsible to tell us the quantity of ten to the power of zero? So that means you know, this is column zero, this is column one, and this is column two. Okay, I hope it doesn't look too confusing. Okay, the zero and one refers to you know, the column number, and then the x y q k s refer to the row. Okay, those are the names of the rows, and we're gonna need to deal with your column three also, but eventually. All right, so I'm just going to pause here and ask, are there any questions about what you see right now on the screen? I have only performed the addition of column zero. 
Okay? What you normally see as something that's simple, which is on the right hand side, I spell things out really, really, you know, spell things out. So it is, it looks a little bit more complicated on the left hand side. Yes? Um, X is an X, Y are both numbers that are given to you that you have to add. Q is kind of the intermediate single digit sum from X and Y. K is carry, and then S is sum. Yep. Well, we'll deal with that. We'll, 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 we'll talk about that next. But that's a good question, okay? <clears throat> All right, so are there any other questions about what we see on the projector at this point? It's just a much more systematic way of performing base 10 multi-digit addition. So let me, let me see if I can you know, just use column one to further explain this. So column one is relatively easy. Three plus six is really just a nine, okay? And that by itself does not give us a carry of one onto column two, which is okay. So now we have nine plus one, which is a 10. So the 10 is a zero with the sum, and then it's a, it also has a carry of one over here. So in the much more conventional way of writing this, then we have three plus six on this side here. Okay, let me, ah, okay, I just lost <clears throat> that screen. Let me get it back. Okay, so we have three plus six, and that's a nine. Nine plus this one, which is a carry from column one, will still give us a 10. So the way we write a 10 is put a zero here, and then a one as a carry of one to you know the last, the most significant digit. Are we still doing okay so far here? So the main difference is in the simplified version, which is you know, what you see on the right-hand side, we don't bother to write out the nine, which is the intermediate sum before we take the carry of one into consideration. But in this case, we spell that out too. Are we doing okay so far with this method? It is just a little bit more redundant compared to your usual way of performing or writing out long addition, but I need that redundancy. I need you know, that verbosity in order to later on abstract the operation. So now we are on to the, uh, the last column, which is column two. Seven plus two, once again, is just a nine. Okay, not a problem. And then this nine plus one is also a zero with a carry of one. And I am just gonna leave it like this, which is not conventional, right? Because you know, most people, when you do it you know, on the more conventional way, which is on the right-hand side here, then you have seven plus two, which is a nine, nine plus the one, which is a carry from column one, will give us a zero. And then we just put a one over here. That's a conventional way to do it. All right, so now we go back and take a deeper look at the left-hand side, okay, you know, which is the more spelled out way of performing multi-digit addition. First of all, the first thing is, whatever number of digits you have for X and Y would be the same number of digits for the sum, okay? You go like, hmm, well that's not, that's not usual, okay? It is not usual because we are trying to figure out a way to perform addition inside the computer, inside the processor. So when you're adding two 8-bit numbers, the result is also an 8-bit number. If you're adding two 32-bit number, the result is also a 32-bit number. If you're adding two 64-bit numbers, you're also resulting in a 64-bit number. So that's why I have to fix the width of the two operands for the addition and the sum they all have to have exactly the same number of digits. Is that part okay? Do you understand why I want to limit all the columns, except for the carry your column, at uh, row, excuse me, all the row, to have exactly the same number of columns? All right, so we're good with that? Okay, so now we are moving on, and we have a question earlier about, you know, what about the carry? How many ways can we end up with a carry? So in this case, we can see how the A plus the seven is the one that is contributing to the carry of one over here. However, 
in the other two columns, it is the Q plus the K that end up with a carry to the next column. It is the Q plus the K that ends up with a carry to the next column. Is that okay? So there are two uh, sources where we can end up with a carry of one. So I'm gonna pause again, okay, just to make sure that we are all kind of absorbing this because you know, this is not the usual way of looking at addition. It is kind of a more, I would say more systematic way to look at addition, but this is what will allow us to figure out how to perform binary addition eventually. Yes? Yep. That is correct. So if you number the, uh, if you refer to the digits, then X, um, X1 plus Y1 can potentially end up with a carry of one to column two, but Q1, K1, Q1 plus K1 can also potentially end up with a carry to column two, okay? So I think some people are thinking, can we end up with two carries, right? You know, can, both, can they both be uh, contributing a carry of one. Yes, go ahead. So isn't uh, a the result of mod of x one? Mm, no. Nope. How do you determine whether there's a carry or not? If it overflows the base of the root. Yes. So a mod is not going to do the trick. Q is the mod. Okay. So let's find out how Q is computed. So Q, uh, particularly Q0, is X0 plus Y0 mod 10. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. Um, if you look at you know, Q1, it is X1 plus Y1, the whole thing, mod 10. So it looks like that rule works okay, okay? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna def I will define two functions. One is the R function, which is the single digit sum function. Um, it is in the notes, okay, so instead of just me, you know, uh, <clears throat> writing it out, I want to show you where to find all of this stuff here, because I'm pretty sure that I reminded the whole class to read ahead of time, because there will be a lot of definitions. So, I'm going to refer back to my notes, <clears throat> which hopefully most people have read a little bit about already. You may be reading some of that and go like, I'm not fully understanding it, but the definitions are important. So when we go all the way to the beginning, I apologize for all the, all the scrolling. So right here, we have two functions. They are in C syntax. The function R, which is what I call a single digit sum, is just you know, adding x, y as single digits and then mod the sum with 10. That is how we end up with the Q, but that's also how we end up with uh, the row S, okay? You know, except row S is the R of uh, Q and K. Well, I'll get back to that later, okay? So can someone guess what C stands for in this case? Carry, very good. So in order to determine if I add a single digit X to a, to a single digit Y, whether I should have a carry of one or a carry of zero, that's what the C function does. All it does is to perform the actual addition, figure out what is the sum of X and Y, and if it is greater than or equal to 10, because we are dealing with base 10 here, then yes, we have a carry of one, otherwise we do not have a carry of one, which, is, which means we have a carry of zero. So I'm gonna let you guys look at this, you know, stare at this for a little bit longer before we move on. So I just want to make sure that we don't have any questions about these two functions or how they are defined and how they are utilized. <clears throat> it might be more useful if I replicate these definitions on the other side, which is you know, the, um, this part here. So I'll just go ahead and rewrite it here. R of single digit xy is defined to be x plus y in base 10 mod 10. C of xy is x plus y being greater than or equal to 10. If so, 
a 1, otherwise a 0. So I am using the ternary operator here. Um, I will use the ternary operator quite often in this class. It is one of the most useful operators because it is a if-then-else in a single expression. Okay, Which means you can use the ternary operator when you are specifying a an argument when you're calling a function, it is really, really useful. So it is time to kind of get used to it, okay? Just because I use it a lot. All right. So are we doing okay so far with the definitions of the R function, which is the single digit sum, and also the C function, which determines whether there's a carry of one or not? We good so far? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you another example of multi-digit addition, and this time it's going to be a really, really easy one. So I just have you know 127 plus um, 916. Okay. So this one is going to be pretty easy. So once again, we have x, y, q, t, and s for sum. All right, so can someone give me all the Qs first? In other words, what is Q0, the, digit, the single digit sum between 7 and 6? What is that? It's a 3. Very good. Okay, so this is 3. What about um, the single digit sum between 2 and 1? Three. It's also a 3. What about the single digit sum between 1 and 9? It's a 0. Very good. Okay, excellent. So we know how to populate this. So now for, oh, okay, that's not a T, it is supposed to be a K, okay? We'll deal with T later on, but today it is a K. So the carry. So K0 is always assumed to be zero for the time being, okay? Because we don't have any addition to the right-hand side of this column. So this is always going to be a zero. So can someone tell me what is K of one? one. K of one is a one, and it has to do with these two contributing to that one. What about k of two? Zero. It is a zero because two plus one does not end up with a carry of one. Three plus one also does not end up with a carry of one. So that's why k two is a zero. So remember how we number the columns? Column zero, column one, column two. What about uh, k three? K3 is a 1 because 1 plus 9 ends up with a carry of 1. Very good. So now we work on the last column, the bottom column, I mean row. Um, what is S0? Three. It's a 3 because 3 plus 0 is a 3. What about 3? Um, that's a 4. <laughs> okay, I don't even have to. And zero. very good. Okay, so we, I think we're getting the hang of this really kind of verbose way of performing multi-digit addition in base 10. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, so here comes the, I would say, a trickier part of this class. It is abstraction, which means I have shown you a few examples. I have shown you, you know, these two functions here. So now I want to define the digits using the function working on other digits. Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, you can only have one of them getting a carry of one. It is not possible for the x plus the y to end up with a carry of one and the q and the k ending up with a carry of one. It is not possible. I'll, I'll prove to you later on why that is the case. Yep, go ahead. It is because inside the computer, um, when you're adding two 64-bit numbers, the result is also just 64 bits. So that's why you know I'm I'm trying to make everything as um, as related as possible to what is happening inside the processor. So inside the processor, we have you know, you know we have the fixed width for these two and the sum. 
So in the base 10 example, I'm doing the same thing. No, nope, this is not an underflow. Uh, it is, it's, a perf it's, a, it's a perfectly correct answer. Because you know, what we end up with here is 127 plus 916 is 43, but with a carry of 1,000, right? Because that extra carry that has no place to go is on column three. So the column three is specifying the number of thousands in base 10. So, no, not necessarily. I mean, when you, when you perform this kind of calculation in the computer, um, it would just chop this bit out and it will only store this result. So whether you have a problem because you're running out of digits to store the sum or not is language dependent. C and C++ does not care. So you better make sure that you have the right width for your integers because if you run out of digits in an addition, there's no sign whatsoever that you ran out. In Visual Basic, it does generate an exception. Um, I'm not sure about Java, but I would assume that Java can generate an exception if that is happening. Yep. Say again? Mm -hmm. Yes, but the question is what happens when you add one to it? What happens when you add one to the largest integer value? Yep, exactly. So it doesn't care. No, you are, you're basically representing a value that is not the correct answer. Yeah, but we'll get to that later, okay? We, we, we are dedicating an entire module on just signed versus unsigned representation. So when we get there, then we get to see, oh, what happens if the result is, cannot be represented given the number of bits. So we'll, we'll deal with that later. All right. So as promised, you know, I just need to figure out a way to relate the digits. So the first thing I want to ask is, what do you think is Q of I? I being the digit you know, number or the position of the digit. So Q of I is, how do we calculate Q of I? Okay, so can we use a function to do that? Which function does that? Which function, huh? The R function, okay, very good. Okay, so we'll do, we'll specify the R function. So inside the R function, what do we use as arguments? XI and YI, okay? So we got XI, YI. In other words, you know, if you know what R function, what the R function is, we can compute all the Q of I digits uh, once I know all the x, i, y, i digits. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so we'll work on the other one that is also easy, which is s of i. So what do you think s of i is? Look at, the, look at this one here. Say again. Q, i, k, i are involved. Okay, so how do we combine those into... Put it through R again, very good, okay. But so now you understand why I defined the function R because I need to use it more than once, okay? So SI is a Q of I, K of I as arguments to the R function. Very good, okay. So here comes the more difficult one. What about the K digits, okay? So I'm gonna define K of I plus one, okay? So what can contribute to K of I plus one? Look at all the circled and an, an arrow, right? Circle and an arrow. Well, I should have another one here, circle and an arrow, and then we saw some earlier as well. So let me just add the last you know, circle and an arrow, okay? All right, oh, okay, screensaver. <clears throat> all right, so what about K of I plus one? What do you think it looks like? Okay, so x, y does not give us a result. So what do we do with the x, y digits? 
C for carry. Okay. Yes. So C of X I Y I. Okay. That accounts for a few cases, right? Because it accounts for this one, this one, and this one. But that's not the only way, right? This, this is not the only way for a column to end up with a k bit of one. What is the other way? C of q i and k i. Okay, very good. So C of q i and k i. All right. So at this point, we are only concerned about arithmetic operations. How should I combine these two values? Plus, hmm? Okay, or is actually the ultimately correct answer, but we're gonna use plus for now, okay? <clears throat> so we'll just use a actual regular arithmetic plus. Yes? Yes. So C, uh, in this case, because QI or Q1 is a nine, and then K1 is a one, the nine plus that one ends up with a 10. The zero is recorded as S1, but then we also have a carry of one to K2. Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Not remainder. We, there, there's no remainder whatsoever. R is the remainder. So, so, so it depends on what you're using for the I, right? If I is one, <coughs> then you're computing K of two, which is this one here. So K of two depends on X one, Y one or the carry you know, from X1, Y1. It also depends on the carry of Q1, K1. So you have to pay attention to the subscript because you know, the subscript on the left-hand side of the K is an I plus one, but the subscript of everything to the right-hand side of the equality are just I. Yep. Yes, well, the, the question is why? Why can't it be two? In other words, why is it not possible that you have your C of X, I, Y, I being a one, and then C of Q, I, K, I also being a one? Yes. Hmm? Nope, has nothing to do with the base. Okay, so to answer that question, okay, we have to look into Q of I. What is Q of I? Q of I is R of X I Y I, right? So you look at the R of something, then you say, okay, um, when can C of Q I K I be a one? That's the first question, okay? So I'm gonna attempt to answer the question. C of Q I K I is a one. And there's only one possible way for that to happen, if and only if. That's the if and only with you know, symbol. What is the only case that QI, KI can be a one? Yes, but there's only one specific case. The only way this can happen is when QI is a nine and KI is a one. I claim that that is the case. All right. Now, of course, you know this looks like a circular reasoning because you know I'm trying to explain why k of i plus one can only be a zero or one. But just go with me for now, okay? Does that make sense to you? Q of c of q i k i can be a one if and only if q i is a nine and k i is a one. Look at all the examples here. Do they all fit that description?
Okay, so, so nobody has a problem with this, right? Okay, so now the question is, when can QI be a one? So QI is a one, is implying what? Oops, QI is a nine, sorry. I misspoke. QI is a nine implies what? what Q, how do we compute Q of I? Well, okay, the first thing it implies is easy. R of XI, YI is nine, because after all, that's how Q of I is defined. Is that okay? I'm simply using this equation here and plug in what we know about Q of I. Then we say, oh, if Q of I is a nine, then R of XI, YI is also a nine. So the question is, what can possibly make XI, R of XI, YI be a nine? In other words, uh, let me open a new page here. What I'm really asking is when we look at um, XI plus YI, the whole thing mod 10 being a nine, <clears throat> What do we know about X, I, Y, I? Hmm? They're single digits. They are, they are, they're confined to be single digits. In other words, we already know there's a limitation that X, I can only go from 0 to 9. We also know that Y, I can only go from 0 to 9. So we can spell out all the cases, right? We can, we can enumerate, okay? We can enumerate and say, okay, these are the possible ways, X, I, Y, I. When x i is a zero, y i has to be a nine. When x i is a one, y i has to be eight, two, seven, three. I mean, you guys can see the pattern, right? Four, five, five, four, six, three, um, seven, two, eight, one, nine, zero. I have exhausted every single way to make r of x i y i being a nine. Does any one of these cases will end up with a carry of one? And a proof, done. Now, not actually, <laughs> because you also have to prove the other way around, which means if C of X, I, Y, I is a one, does that imply Q of I has to be less than nine? Okay, let's, let's, see whether, but let's see whether we can prove that also, okay? So what I'm trying to prove on the next page, okay? Well, when it changes the page, come on, there we go. All right, so the question is, what if C of X, I, Y, I is a one to begin with? What does that imply? Okay, now this time there are many more cases. I'm not gonna enumerate every single possible case. But I can say this, right? Because based on the definition of C, I can now say, oh, okay, we know how this happens. Uh, when XI plus YI is greater than or equal to 10, okay, because that is the definition of the C function. Does that make sense? Okay, you look at this and go like, okay, so what is the big deal? Well, we also know the largest value of XI and YI, right? What is the range of xi? What is the range of yi? They're single digits in the base 10 number. They can only go from zero to nine. So that means the largest value of xi is a nine. The largest value of yi is also a nine. Nine plus nine is 18, obviously greater than or equal to 10, explains the carry function being a one. But what about the r function in that case? If, 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 if. Yep, so this implies R of XI, YI, which is our QI, has to be less than nine. Does that make sense to you? If I have two single digit in base 10, okay, their sum is greater than or equal to 10. Okay, that's a given, okay? Can we, are you convinced that when you add up those two values and you do a mod 10, that result is going to be less than nine? 
Are you convinced? Well, we can go through a few examples. If you're not convinced, you know, this is not the best way to prove something, but it can give you an intuitive answer of, you know, how that works. Five plus five is 10. The carry is a one, right? What about five plus five, five, the whole thing, mod 10? What is that? 10 mod 10 is zero, very good. Um, six plus six, okay, is 12. 12 mod 10 is a two. Okay, so if you continue with this tra trajectory, you go like, oh, but we really want that result of the mod to be as large as possible, right? So it kind of makes sense to go like, oh, we, I guess we have to max out both xi and yi. Yes, go ahead. xi maxes out at nine, yi maxes out at nine also. Nine plus nine is 18, 18 mod 10 is eight. And that's the worst you can do. That's the maximum you can do. And guess what? Eight is still less than nine. But why is that important? Because when R of xi, yi is a nine, then qi is less than nine. Why? Because that is how we calculate q of i. But if q of i is less than nine, then imp that implies c of qi, ki. I don't even care what ki is, because ki can only be a zero or one. <clears throat> that implies this has to be a zero. So this concludes the proof of on, um, only up to one of the two C you know, functions can result in a one. They cannot both be ones. They can both be zeros, not a problem, but they cannot both be ones. Are we convinced about that? Exactly, because in that case, C of X, I, Y, I would not have been a one. So in this case, I'm starting with the assumption that C of X, I, Y, I is a one to begin with, and I want to find out if, if X, C of X, I, Y, I is a one to begin with, what is the worst you can do with R of X, I, Y, I? Turns out to be, oh, the worst you can do is eight. We can use a or instead of a plus. Okay, so let me spell out the original thing. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the whole thing here. K of i plus one is c of x i y i, and I'm using a normal plus for now. C of q i k i. But what we know is c of x i y i being a one implies c of q i ki is a zero, and vice versa. Uh, Q of, oops, C of qi ki being a one implies C of xi yi being a zero. Okay, so these two conclusions are derived from that long discussion that we just had, but the bottom line is, oh, they cannot both be ones, because if one is one already, it implies the other one cannot be a one. Is that okay? So now we have to look at the table. Not a, it's not a truth table anymore. It's more like just a normal operator table. So now we look at C of X, I, Y, I, C of Q, I, K, I, and they can both be zeros. We don't have a problem because they can all be, you know, all the digits can be zeros. One can be a zero, one can be a one, one can be a one, the other one can be a zero. Oops. And they cannot be both be ones. So the last row does not matter, okay? There's no one one in this case. So when you look at the addition of these two, okay, zero plus zero is a zero, zero plus one is a one, one plus zero is also a one. But when you use an or operator, guess what? We get exactly the same thing. So that's why you know, we do not need an arithmetic addition in this case we can instead use a logical or, which is a great thing to have, okay? Because eventually we want to boil everything down to logic gates. But why is that important? Not with the digital computers that we have, 
okay? You know, if you use an op M analog type of computer, yes, you can actually perform addition, arithmetic addition in, in that sense, okay? <clears throat> so we want to boil everything down to logic gates, you know, which are our and, or, not, nand, nor, you know, that sort of thing. And, but those are just logic gates, you know, but real computers make use of transistors. What is the last step that you need to do? It goes all the way back to the first class. If we can express everything using logical and, logical or, logical not, what is the next step to say, oh, we can, we can do all this using a whole bunch of transistors? Express them as NANDs because we can implement a NAND2 gate using two P transistors and two N transistors. That was the very first thing that we did in week one, the first class, okay? Very good, okay, I'm, I'm glad you're making that connection because that's the whole thing about how I teach this class is at the end of the entire semester, you'll be looking at C code translated into assembly code, assembly code translated into operations inside the processor, each component of the processor translating into logic gates, and then all the logic gates translating into NAND2 gates, the NAND2 gate translating into four transistors. Now, is that really the best way to do things? No, probably can be optimized a little bit and whatnot, but that's how computers work. All right? Okay. Also not related to this class. Well, it is related to this class, but it's not on the SLO or it's not on the student learning outcome. Why is that important? Why do we want to know how C code eventually boil down to transistors? Yep. Well, there is a part of a compiler in here, which is from C code into assembly language code but most computer science people do not have to go any further, you know, in terms of going lower level compared, you know, um, when, when you get to assembly language, you know, code, you're, you're done. Because, you know, nothing in the process, you cannot change anything in the processor itself, or not in most processors. But why is it important for me to talk about it? Mm, I don't think we do it this way. You know, there are no N and P transistors in our head. <clears throat> but there's one thing that um, Sam Altman said just recently, I think it was sometime last week. Who is Sam Altman? Yes, okay, I'm glad you guys at least keep up with the news a little bit, okay? And what he said last week was, the AI stuff, chat GPT and all the other stuff that you know, Google, Facebook, okay, and X and so on, is using up a lot of processing power. And right now they are running out of processing power. If you can believe it, we are running out of processing power. So what does that have anything to do with what we are doing here? What do you do when you run out of processing power? What do you think is the limiting factor of how much processing power you can pack in a space. Okay. Huh? No, it's, it has to do with heat, okay? So all the power, all the energy that you pump into a data center, most of it is turning into heat. Very little is actually, quote unquote, doing the computation. Most are dissipated as heat. Yes? Um, that's for optimizing the speed, okay? You know, because you know, when you have cache, you know, it's faster to get to cache than the actual memory. But that the caching is a really old technology. We have been doing it for many, many years. But the problem is, <clears throat> in a in a certain space, you can only get rid of heat so fast. That is the actual threat, the, the limitation of how much processing power you can pack in a space like a data center is how much heat can you dissipate? Okay, well, we can try to build a data center at the bottom of the ocean. Been there, done that, people have done it already. It's still limited, okay? You can only, you can only get rid of heat so fast. 
So what does that have anything to do with what we are talking about here? Yes. Well, it has it has more to do with how do we organize the transistors. It has little to do with how many transistors we can put into a computer or a data center. It has to do with how they are organized. Okay, I'll put it this way. How many of you, okay, you don't have to answer because I think most of you would not answer. If you're a gamer, okay, you go like, yeah, I got a pretty good you know, graphics card, I got a pretty good GPU, right? What if I were to tell you, you cannot have your GPU anymore? You go like, oh, that would suck. Life has no meaning anymore. Because, why? Because all my games would run so slow, they are not playable anymore. I go like, they should, they should still be playable. Because your main processor, the Pentium processor or the AD AMD processor, can perform all the operations that your GPU can, oper can, can perform just a little slower. Right? We're having the same problem here. Okay, all the AI related calculations, they can be performed using a regular processor, not a problem, but not very efficiently. And that is why the power is utilized, but is not utilized in a very efficient way. So once again, how does, what does that have anything to do with what we just talked about? Translating everything all the way down to transistors. You're trying to make an AI chip so that the, the, the design of the chip, the design of that processor is optimized for the kind of calculation that we need in, say, you know, chat GPT and so on. Okay? But that is not the job of a computer scientist. You know, why am I going after a computer science program? Well, that is a question that I cannot answer for you. <laughs> because Figuring out how to make efficient chips to perform certain types of calculation is the job of a computer engineer, hardware engineer or computer engineer to be more specific. So now don't you know, get too disappointed because to transition from a computer science person to a computer engineer person is like this. It's like this. They are so close, okay? It's only the emphasis that is different in their program. They are not that different. So the way I teach this class will allow you to basically just sidestep, oh, okay, I'm an engineer now, but whoop, I'm, a, I'm a scientist now. Because you know, they are really just that close. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, no. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you know, more details about you know, how this is. We are a long way from you know, doing things effectively. We are not even doing binary yet, right? So we'll, we'll get to that point you know, to, get, to get to how do we do things in base two, and then how do we do things in an easy way, which, which is not efficient, and then how do we do things in an efficient way, but it's gonna look really ugly, okay? So that's the purpose of this class, okay? You know, is, kind of to take you through this journey. All right, so the next question is, okay, we just figure out how to perform multi-digit base 10 addition. In other words, I just spent, what, uh, close, to ha close to an hour to teach you something that you have learned in elementary school. But we now need to kind of segue into base two. How do we do that? How do we change everything that we knew about base 10 edition and say, okay, now we can do base two. I will switch to the slide that is relevant and I hope some of you will go like, oh, just that, okay. The way the digits relate to each other does not change no matter what base you're using. In other words, the way Q of I is R of X, I, Y, I. The way that S of I is the R of Q, I, K, I. Or the way that K of I plus one 
is C of X I Y I or C of Q I K I. That does not change. Okay, you can do calculation in any base, and they still have to play by those rules. So when you change from base ten to base two, what are you really changing? Exactly. All we are doing is to say, mm, make it a two, and make it a two. That's all we need to do, because the structure of multi-digit addition, the concept of carry, the concept of single-digit sum, they are universal across all the bases. Is that okay? Do you see why I had to do that abstraction, but introduce the abstraction using base 10? Because that's what we are familiar with. So now that we have to deal with base two, we just have to define C and R a little bit. Okay, so I'm switching back to the tablet to redefine C and R. So in base two, um, R of X, Y, if I just use the same function, okay, it is just you know x plus y, the whole thing mod two instead of mod ten. Woo. C of x y is x plus y is greater than or equal to two. If that is the case, return a one. Otherwise, return a zero. They look exactly the same as the base ten version, except the tens are replaced by twos. That's it. That is it. But we have a problem. The problem is um, none of these are implemented using gates. None of these are logical operators. Okay, they are using. We are still using um, arithmetic addition. We are still using comparison. We are still using mod. Mod is ugly. Why? Because it is division. Division is always ugly. Because it's a long operation. It takes a long time to do it. So what can we do about this? Well, let's take a look at what is really happening here. We got x, we got y, we have r of x, y, and then we have c of x, y. We are enumerating every single possible way that we have to deal with, you know, in the case of base two. What can x be? What can y be? x and y are independent variables, which means the value of one does not influence the value of the other one. But in this case, guess what? It is in base two. So what can x be? What can the value of x as a single digit in base two be? Zero or one. Okay. So x can be zero or one. Y is the same way. Okay. Y can be zero or one. Just like that. Oh. So instead of like in base ten, we have one hundred cases because it's ten times ten. We only have four cases. I think we can work these out, don't you think? Okay, all right. So let's work it out. What is R of x, y when x and y are both zeros? Zero. That's an easy one. What about C of x, y? Zero. Yeah, that's an easy one too. What about uh, when x is zero, y is one? What is R of x, y? It's a one. What about C of x, y? And what about the next row? One, zero. Okay. What about the last row? Zero, one. Very good. Okay. Because one plus one is a two. Two mod two is a zero. Okay. You look at this and go like, huh. Kind of resembles some kind of a truth table, because it really is. You can look at this as a truth table. So we're going to look at this here one by one. We'll start with the easy one. Okay, start with c of x y. If you just ignore the r of x y, you know, column, what does this look like from the truth table perspective? Looks like an and. It is an and. Okay, so that means in base two and only in base two. This is the same thing as x and y. Okay, that's nice, okay, because I can implement AND using NAND, and I can implement NAND using transistors. That journey is completed here. 
And then you look at R, X, R of x, y, and go like, hmm, we don't have a single Boolean operator that can do that. So the answer to that question is, well, yeah, yeah, you cannot do it. Hmm? It is exclusive or. But we don't have exclusive or in C++. So that means, huh, OK, so tech. What, what do we do now? We, we do not have, ex have exclusive OR, nor have I talked about how to use NAND to implement exclusive OR. So you guys go like, ha, huh, okay, you know, tech is stumped at this point. No, not really, easy. <laughs> because this is the, the same thing as the negation of X and Y, or X and the negation of Y. Looks a little ugly, looks a little long, but it will get the job done. Now, I just made a claim, so if you want to test it, make your own truth table, okay? Plug in that your know, really ugly, long Boolean expression, which is this one here, into this truth table, and convince yourself that R of x, y in base two is indeed, can, it can be expressed using this rather long Boolean expression. Are we doing okay so far? Yes? Okay. So I'm gonna introduce you know, the shorthand notation because I don't really like to write ampersand, ampersand, or bar, bar you know, for or. So from here on, I'm gonna use the shorthand. So in a Boolean context, <clears throat> in a Boolean context, like you know, in this case, in base two, I'm just going to say this is not x and y, or x and not y. Most of the time, that dot is gone as well, okay? You know, because you know, I use um, this is the computer engineer notation for Boolean operators. We talked about this a little bit at the very beginning of the class, you know, the alternative notations for conjunction and disjunction. Uh, for negation, I keep the exclamation point simply because it is easy to type and it is less confusing than the slash, which most people associate with division. But this is the notation, okay? You know, so that plus is not an addition, it is a or. That dot is not a multiplication, it is a conjunction. The exclamation point is a logical not or negation. So from here on, I'm gonna use the simplified notation, which is easier for me to type and write, you know, and so on. Are we still doing okay? Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. Some people do that too. Yep. I'm not using that notation because I cannot type it with a regular text editor. Yep. So the whole point is, you know, make it easier so that I can type it, you know, easier. Yep. All right. So let me check the time. Yeah, let's go ahead and take roll, you know, to have a really, really short break. And then we're going to get back and go like, um, are we really sure this is going to work? All right, so today's road taking activity is already done. I have to refresh it first. All right, so where is it? Huh. I did not, I thought I fixed it. Oh, it's right here, okay. <clears throat> the wrong one. I fixed the wrong one, but now it's visible to you. And the access code is what password? Literally, what password with an uppercase P? I can imagine this can be a, a plot in a spy movie. What is the password? Oh, okay, the time. Got a little, little too carried away with the spy story. All right, so I'll give you guys till eh, 6.45. Okay, save.
So if you refresh your browser now, you should be able to get in. And the password is, once again, your know, what password with a uppercase P for password. I can imagine a, a spy story. It's like, what is the password to get into this your secret thing? What password? I'm going to kill you if you don't tell me. What password? Right. All right, so I think most of you are done with that. So the next thing I'm going to do is to show you in Logisim how we can you know, get this circuit to work. All right, so this is going to, I think, take the rest of today's class, okay? But it is also a refresher of how to use Logisim, you know, so that can be can be useful. All right, so the first thing we need to do is to look at the R function and the C function, and then we just have to implement those, you know, as logic gates. Yep. Go ahead. It's a little bit late to double check. <laughs> it is being recorded. I'm just I'm just yanking your chain. Yep. All right. <laughs> it is being recorded, so all is good. All right. So now what we want to do is to actually make the circuit and see how it works. Okay. So what we'll do is we are going to um, pull a AND gate. Okay. This is an AND gate. We can also get an AND gate using go you know, here. So we'll use get an AND gate. And get an exclusive OR gate. Okay, this is the exclusive OR gate. Both are way too big and have you know, they have too many input pins. So we're going to have to change you know, the num number of input pins from five down to two, and then change the gate size from medium to narrow, just so, just because we don't really need all that stuff. Um, and then we'll have two input pins. Okay, and yes, I'm talking about two input pins. So here's one, here's the other one, and two output pins. One comes out of the AND gate, and one comes out of the OR gate, like so. And I'll go ahead and label things, okay, just so that you know, things are easier to remember. We can see, oh, this is, you know, so I would use, instead of using X, Y, I'm going to use uh, U and V, just so that we don't confuse these with the actual role you know, being, uh, that we have to talk about. So this is uh, U, and this is V, and if, so I'm going to ask you guys how to label the output in just a little bit. So I'm just going to hook up the input pins to the gates in this particular way, and this goes straight out to this output pin, and this goes straight out to this output pin. All right. So how should I output? Uh, how should I label? this particular output pin using the R versus the C. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it does the same thing as the R. Okay, so let me go back to the slide that I had earlier. There we go. That's exclusive OR. This is actually what exclusive OR does. But since exclusive OR is not one of the logical operators in C and C++, in here, I decided to spell it out using just regular um, Boolean operators that we all know in C and C++. But if we had an exclusive OR logical operator, we could, we could have used it. <clears throat> All right. So getting back to the diagram. Okay. So how should I label this output pin? This is C of UV. And what about the other one? R of UV. OK, very good. There we go. So this is what we call a half adder. Okay. So I'm going to change the circuit name. 
So the way to change the circuit name is to switch to the appearance. Nope, okay, I guess not. Click on the empty area and then go to the circuit name here. I'm gonna change this to become a have underscore adder. Okay, so if a circuit is, a, is called a half adder, what do you think is the next circuit we're gonna build? A full adder, okay, very good, okay. So this is the sort of thing that most computer science people should be able to do is to look at a pattern and be able to predict what is the next thing that is coming. You know, two halves make a full, right? Okay, so now we're gonna create a full adder so we go to project, add a new circuit. We call this a full adder. Okay, so let me describe here the inputs to the full adder and the output of the full adder. And then you guys can tell me how to make use of the half adder. So one of the input pin is going to be called XI. One of the input pin is gonna be called YI. And the last input pin, the third one, is called KI. All right, and let me just kind of move these to the right place. And then as for the output, um, one output is SI, and then the other output is K of I plus one. Okay, now, that's it, okay? In terms of the input versus the output, this is all we have. Three input pins, two output pins. Based on what we know about the roles and all the definitions of those you know, digits, how do we use a how do we use two half adders and one additional gate to get this done? That is the question. Okay, so we are going to go to the half adder. Let me change the appearance of the half adder first. Okay, so there we go. Change the appearance because you know it makes sense to. Label these pins, okay, so we can tell which one is which one. So we got U, V, uh, I think the top one is C of U, V, and then the bottom one is R of U, V. Oops, there we go. And kind of stack them up a little bit nicer so they look better like this and like this. The other one can be inside. I think that's good. All right. So now I need two of those, okay? So I'm gonna slap the two of these things over here. Oop, okay, that's not what I want to do. Okay. Okay, first of all, what do we need first to do anything? We need a Q, right? But Q is not one of the output. But how do we compute Q out of X and Y? We can use a half adder. We can use one half of the half adder to compute the Q, right? So how do we wire up these things so that we can have Q? Okay. I'll give you a big hint here. <laughs> okay, here's the big hint. Okay, so now how, what do we do? Okay, this, that. All right, and then where do we get Q? R, okay, very good. This is R, okay. Oh, this is Q, sorry, this is Q of I. So I'm just gonna label this thing as, okay, this wire is known as Q of I. Okay. Very good. And now what do we do to get to SI? How do we compute SI based on what we talked about earlier? Okay. It's QIKI connected by what function? R, very good. Ah, we have another R function not used here, so I'm just gonna slap that over, I guess here is good. Okay. And then the output of R is our SI already, okay. Yes, it is red, you know, because one of the input is not, you know, connected to anything. So that's why it's red, because it cannot determine what the output is supposed to be. So that's fine, not a problem. Hmm. What about K of I plus one? What do we do to get to K of 
i plus one. There are a few things we still haven't connected yet. So if you go back to how k of i plus one is defined, what are the two components that we need? Both of the C's, so that would be C of X, I, Y, I, and the C of Q, I, K, I. Okay, very good. Okay, so I'm glad you guys are paying attention. Excellent. So K of, so we need, um, both of these C's are not used, but this is already C of X, I, Y, I, so I'm just going to take it, uh, bring it down here, and we can do something about that later. Okay. And then C of Q, I, K, I is not even done yet. Because this is Q of I, this is K of I, so I have to wire up these two first. Okay. Oh, I need that to do uh, S of I anyway, so I forgot to do that earlier. But this is C of Q, I, K, I. This is C of Q, I, K, I, because Q, I is what is going into U, K, I is what is going into V. So this particular output is C of Q, I, K, I. So now I have the two components uh, available. So what do we do again to get to K of I plus one? I got the two C of blah, blah. We need to or them. Okay, very good. So we need an extra or gate. Okay, so we just pull a or gate from here and we can change a few things, make it look nicer. Okay, to input like that. And if I really want to make things look a little bit nicer, I suppose I can turn it to face south. I mean, this is just cosmetics. There's nothing, there's nothing functional with what I'm doing here. It is all just making it look nicer. So the output here is what? K of I plus one, that's right. Okay, very good. Go ahead. This is a regular OR. How do we know it's a regular OR? It is selected, and it tells you what it is. Yep. Um, where did I mess up? Oh, wait. OK, yep, you're right. <clears throat> Pulling the wrong bit here, because it is supposed to be the C. There we go. Very good, thank you, good catch. All right, so now we have a full adder, okay? This is a full adder. So now we want to perform um, a multi-bit addition in base two. So the question is, how do we do that? Let's, make, let's try to make a three bit by three bit adder, okay? So we'll try to figure out how to do that. So I'm gonna make another circuit here, and I'll just call this your three by three adder like so. So with a 3x3 three three adder, I'm going to need you know, x, y. They're both going to be 3 bit wide. So this is x, this is y. They both should be 3 bit wide, like that. And then start to label this. This is x, and this is y. And in this particular case, I'm going to make a one input bit being k0. So I'm not going to assume k0 is a 0. We can always make it a zero by clicking this pin here to make it a zero, but I'm not going to assume that it is zero. All right, and then the output is going to be the sum, and that has to be three bit wide as well because you know that is it has to have the same width as x y. And then the extra one is going to be the overall carry. In this case, it's going to be known as k three. All right, so now what do we do? Okay, so we need three full adders. Okay, very good. So we're gonna stack, you know, slap them in here first, okay? And then we'll, we'll decide what to do with them later. So we have one. Oh, okay, I forgot to. Oh, because I, I was clicking on the wrong thing. There we go. Okay, and now what do we do? Now, the full adder can only work with single bit inputs. The input pin, on the other hand, is a three-bit input pin. So what do you think we need at this point so that we can work with the full adders? Splitters, very good. <clears throat> so we're gonna need two 
you know, we need three splitters all together because we need another splitter to merge the bits back into the sum. So I'm just going to pull a single one, configure it correctly, and then I'll do, I will multiply that, duplicate it twice. So we need three input bits, and the fan out is going to be all three because we need each and every individual bit. Okay. And now I can duplicate it twice. Okay. This one goes here and duplicate it one more time. This one goes here. And then the very last one has to be over here, but I have to kind of flip it first. So instead of facing east, I can make it face west. All right. All right. So now we have, we have all the components. We just need to wire things up at this point. All right, so let's work with uh, bit zero first. So bit zero of the sum is coming out of, you know, is coming from here. So where do you think this should connect to? Okay, one of the, which, which bit of the full adder? Okay, let me, let me, let me do a slightly better job documenting the, uh, the components first, okay? Because otherwise, you guys look at the full adder and go like, well, I have no idea which pin is which pin. That's why we have the appearance, in, and this allows you to label the individual bits. All right, so it has xi as an input, yi as an input, ki as an input, um, si as an output, and then k of i plus one as an output. So let me move these things into the right place. So this is our xi, this is our yi, this is our ki, and then SI is the one on the top. K of I plus one is the one at the bottom. All right, so now <clears throat> it should be a little bit easier to make the connection. So uh, let's just say that this SI, I wanted to go to bit zero. How do I wire up the inputs into that particular full adder? So you just have to ask yourself, S of zero is what? Yep, okay, so, so it depends on x0, y0. So that means, you know, I need x0 to be here. I need y0 to be here. What about k0? Where is k0? It's all the way here. Okay, so I'm, I'm making the circuit look really ugly. There we go. Okay, nice. So we got S0 done. What about S of one? Well, if it's a S of one, it is a sum bit. So, <clears throat> so we hook it up here. And where do you think this, this needs to go? This is XI, goes to X1, very good. All right, come on. There we go. And this is Y1. Um, where am I going to find K1? The K of the KI plus one from the top full adder is our K1. Okay. So, okay. All right. So that doesn't sound too hard. It does make the picture look a little messy. But we can do messy. There we go. Whew. Doesn't look very nice, but it's going to work. All right, so this is our last sum bit. It has to go to S2. So that means that we have to connect X2 and Y2 to the XI, YI. So here's XI going to X2. This is Y2 going to yi, and k2 is really the same thing as k of i plus one from the previous full adder, okay? So yes, I know it looks ugly. There we go. And what about this pin here? This is k of i plus one, and i is two for this particular full adder, so k of i plus one is actually k of three, very good. <clears throat> Cool. So now we have a full adder. 
Now we have not only a full adder, we have an, a three by three adder. The question is, how do we test this circuit? We, we got about 30 seconds or so. That's more than enough time to do it. Give me two numbers between zero and seven. Five and four, okay. So five is X, okay. Five is one, zero, one in binary. Four is one, zero, zero in binary. And this is our result. All of you are going like, no, this cannot be right. Because, you know, five plus four is a one with a carry. What, what is going on here? The question is, what is that carry representing? It's, it's representing the quantity of eight. Very good. Because it is K3, right? Because, so it is representing the quantity of eight as a carry, as the extra thing that I cannot represent using those three bits. Eight, which is the carry amount, plus the one, which is actually the part, which is actually the sum, is nine. That is exactly what we're expecting. So it does work, but I'm going to give you uh, a few more things here before we conclude today's lecture. This is very nice from the perspective of, oh, we just have to, if I need a 64-bit adder, I just need to stamp out 64 of these things, and the way they interconnect is very systematic. It looks very neat. But when it comes down to performance, it sucks. It sucks because k of 3 depends on k of 2, k of 2 depends on k of 1, k of 1 depends on k of 0, which means I need to wait for you know, those carry bits to ripple through the entire circuit for the result to be reliable, for, for the final result. So that means a 64-bit adder is going to take twice as long as a 32-bit adder to get this operation done. A 32-bit adder takes twice as long as a 16-bit adder. Yes, go ahead. Nope. You can. That can only help with reducing one of the ripple stages. So it's not going to help you with a whole lot. Okay, so this method works, but it sucks. It is slow, okay? Next Tuesday, we'll talk about carry look ahead, which is a much faster way of getting things done. But before you go, I still need to give you the access code of today's lab. Don't forget that. So let me switch to here. So the stuff that we talked about today is not easy, okay? There's no way I'm going to pretend that this stuff is easy. Um, so you might need to spend some time to really kind of re, either rewatch the video, go over your notes and stuff like that. But hopefully the lab would also help you with uh, getting a better understanding of the material. Okay, I can show you just the access code and then I can change the uh, due date in, uh, a little bit later. Uh, might as well just do it now. Sorry, I lied, I lied. All right, and then we're gonna say build. All right, so I think the access code is under settings. Yep, and then show access code. Okay, what kind of person would come up with that kind of an access code? No, those are the names of the roles that we talked about today. <laughs> okay, so I hope that's easy to remember. X, Y, Q, K, S. Okay, that's your access code. I'll see you guys over at the lab. Yes, somebody did. Uh, so we took it to... Uh, STEM 301, since you have to go there anyway. So go to STEM 301 and ask the person at the counter, um, you know, that you lost a water bottle on Tuesday. Uh, and they will probably ask you, what does it look like? What's your name? Blah, blah, and so on. Yep. That's a question.